Welcome to this Property Hub University course called The Complete Guide to Getting Your Property Let. So you've bought a property. Congratulations. There's now only one thing standing between you and getting that rental income coming in. And that, of course, is getting a tenant in place. Well, that is what we're going to teach you to do in this course. So by the end, you'll have gone through every step you need to get a tenant in place and have your rental income coming in. So Rob, the first decision to make is whether you should do it yourself or use a letting agent. So first of all, let's look at the pros and cons of using a letting agent. The pros are that you are going to have less work to do. If your letting agent is good, they can find your tenant. And if you choose, manage your property. That's pretty nice. They'll do the rest for you. They'll also be your guide. Letting agents can be experts in their field and they'll be able to tell you if things change in the market, if legislation comes into place, that means you need to adapt your strategy and also keep an eye on the rents and make sure they're at market level. And if the opportunity is there, possibly raise them a bit as well, producing you more income. So there are lots of pros to working with a letting agent. The cons, well, the obvious is that you're gonna have to pay for that service. So you're gonna have to fork out some money. On average, it's gonna be 10% plus fat of your rent if you have it fully managed and a good few hundred pounds if you just get them to let it. Another potential con is if you don't pick your letting agent wisely, you might end up spending a lot of time on the project anyway by running around after them and chasing them for updates. So if you do choose to work with a letting agent, choose wisely. So making this decision will depend on a few things, whether you value your time more, or saving a few extra quid. Or if you've not done this before, you may take comfort by working with an expert. And then in the future, you may decide to do it yourself. So for the rest of this course, we're going to assume that you're doing everything yourself, because otherwise there wouldn't be much to say. You'd just be find a letting agent and give them the keys. But even if you do decide to use a letting agent, you should still keep watching because by having this knowledge, you can use it to check that the agent is doing things as they're meant to. And that's really important because if you pick a not so good agent and you don't have the knowledge yourself, you won't know if they're doing a bad job and possibly putting your investment at risk. So that's it for this first module. In the next one, we'll look at which types of tenants you're going to be In this targeting. module, we're going to talk about your target market. Because when you're marketing a property, it's just like marketing any other product or service. You need to know who your customer is going to be. This is really important to know right at the start because depending on who you want to attract, you'll make different decisions about how you present the property and where you market it. In other words, what is the product and how do you get it in front of people? So there are lots of different groups of tenants. You could be going after families. You could be going after young working professionals. Could be retirees could be students. And there's also lots of different income levels you could be targeting. A property where you're trying to attract the top 20% of earners is going to be very different from if you're trying to attract the bottom 20% of earners. There are lots of distinctions and you don't need to have it mapped out to the extent of knowing how tall they're going to be or what their hair colour is going to be. But you should have an idea of who your target market will be. And Rob, a large part of this decision is actually made for you by the property. It is. So if you have a one bedroom apartment in a city centre, then a family of four isn't probably going to move in. And you probably wouldn't want them to either. Just as if you buy a house in suburbia, it's less likely to attract young professionals if you haven't got quick transport links into the city centre. Now, this isn't a hard and fast rule. And of course, there are always exceptions. But if you've got a particular profile in mind, then you need to make sure the property that you go for matches it. Now, in reality, you should have had this figured out by now. Really, when you're buying the property before buying, you should have an idea of who the property is going to attract because that forms part of your investment case. And if you're going to be doing a refurb or furnishing the property, that's going to have an impact on the decisions you make there as well. So really, this should be a tick in the box that you already have. But if not, work it out now before moving on. In the next module, we will move on to where you're going to advertise. In this module, we're going to look at where you can advertise to get your property let. Billboards, TV adverts, Probably not, but there are some good places you should be advertising. The first and most obvious are the major portals. So you've probably heard of Rightmove and you've probably heard of Zoopla. They're the big two. They're the places that most tenants will go to online to find a property to live in. There are some other lesser known portals as well and they may be worth considering, but you want to make sure that you're gonna use at least one of the two main players. Now. If you are letting it yourself, you can't go directly to Rightmove or Supla, but there are service providers out there that will allow you to advertise through them and have your property seen on the major platforms. There's a small cost incurred to do this, but it isn't as much as paying a letting agent to get your property let. So for most simple buy-to-let properties, being on one or more of those major portals is really all you need. Stats show that more than 90% of property searches start on one of these portals. So you're going to capture the vast majority of the market just by being there. 
But there are other channels that you can use. And indeed, for certain property types, it is a good idea to use other channels because the tenants for those tend to be looking in different places. So if you've got an HMO, so you're renting the property out room by room, then there are specialist sites for that. You do see them on the likes of Rightmove, but there are also sites like Spare Room, which are specifically for HMOs. And people who are in that market tend to know that that's the kind of place you should be looking. So it makes sense that that's where your property should be. There's also Facebook groups, which are very popular for certain types of property. It tends to be the case, although this is a generalization, that Facebook groups are more common for cheaper, lower end property. And that's not a value judgment. It's just that some properties are more premium than others. And if you've got a cheaper property where you're charging a lower rent, they tend to be marketed and looked for on Facebook groups. If you do a search, most towns, cities, regions will have a specific Facebook group or more than one specifically for properties to let. So seek those out if that's appropriate in your case. You may also want to have a look at Gumtree. It's not used extensively across the nation, but it does seem to have a bit of traction in London. It doesn't need to be your first port of call, but it's worth checking out to see if your local market is active on Gumtree. And the adverts to place are pretty cheap. So now you know where to advertise, your next step is to decide how much rent are you going to charge? Of course, you'd like to charge loads, but is that realistic? In the next module, we're going to take you through the steps to get to the correct rent. Setting the right rent level is the most important decision you can make when it comes to marketing your property. There are lots of things you can do when you come to put the advert together that boost your chances. But if the amount of rent you charge is too high, none of that is going to matter. You're going to really struggle to rent it out. And of course, you don't want to go too low either because that will affect your returns. So pitching it at the right level is really important. And in most areas, there's a pretty tight range for each type of property that you can generally fall within. The key, Rob, is finding out what that range is and the way to do that is to scope out the competition. The good news is that you don't need to start rifling through other landlords' drawers when they're out to see their rental agreements to find out what they're charging. You can go on the major portals and they will tell you what properties are letting for or close to it. So if you go onto Rightmove or Zoopla, type in the postcode of your property and search within a quarter of a mile then you'll see all the rental properties listed. Now, then you want to narrow the search down to make sure that it's as close of match to yours as possible. So for example, if it's a two bed flat, put it down as a two bed flat. And then look, look for other properties that are similar size, similar condition, and see what they're being let for. The other thing you can do is click the option to see let properties as well, and see a list of properties that have been already let that are similar to yours, which will give you an even better idea what it should be. A sneaky tip is that you could also call letting agents and say, hey, I've got this property, I'm considering to let it, what do you think I can get for it? They'll give you their advice, and if you choose not to work with them afterwards, then, well, you've got a bit more information. But you might be impressed with them and end up letting it with them. So it's a tactic worth using. So taking expert advice can help, but you also need to develop the skill set of looking at the market and seeing where you fit. And it is a skill, because when you first do what Rob said, you go on, you look within a quarter of a mile for two bedroom flats, if that's what you've got. At first, you'll see a whole range of different prices that might seem to be all over the place. And you need to be able to work out which of those are the most similar? In other words, what are the best comparables? Because every property is going to be slightly different. One of the biggest variables is location, but you've already pretty much controlled for that because you're looking within a relatively tight area. Even so, it can be the case that even within a quarter of a mile, you could end up with one end of a street that's more desirable than the other. So location can be a factor. But there are others as well. The obvious one is size. Some properties are bigger than others, but there are others that are less obvious as well. So whether the property is offered furnished is another one. Furnished properties tend to cost more than unfurnished properties. There's also whether parking is included or whether you have to pay extra. And in the case of relatively modern flats, there's things like amenities. So is there a concierge? Is there a gym? So all of these things will affect the price. Once you've looked a bit closer and you've narrowed it down and you've eliminated those that are smaller or fancier or in a different part of town, you should end up with a pretty tight range. Normally, probably about 50 to 75 pounds from cheapest to most expensive that properties are being offered in. So then the final decision you have to make is where you want to position yourself in that range. Now you may straight away think, well, let's charge the most. I want to make the most, let's charge the most. But it's not always that simple. First of all, that range is the asking price normally. So that's what properties are being marketed for. What they actually get let for could be different. 
So those that are being marketed at the top end, they may be starting at the top end with a view that they may take a little bit less. And if you go at the top end, you may have to take that view also. If you want your property let as quickly as possible, then you may want to go near the bottom end of that range. But you don't want to go too low that you're costing yourself money. It's that fine balance that you can get your property let pretty quickly, but you're not cutting yourself short. Once you put your property on to be let and it's gone live, don't wait four weeks. If you haven't seen a substantial amount of interest within the first 24, 48 hours, then chances are you've got your pricing wrong and you need to adapt accordingly. Don't wait and hope that it's gonna get better. It probably won't. So if you do end up on a higher rent and you've not seen any traction, reduce it quickly and see if that works. And if that doesn't work, reduce it again. Remember, a property lying empty doesn't generate you income, but it does cost you money. So getting it let for a little bit less than you initially intended is often better than holding out for that bit more. Of course, price isn't everything. Your property's gotta look good as well and be appealing. And that's what we'll cover in our next module. We're gonna look at crafting a brilliant advert so you have tenants lining up. You've got a great property. You know who you're marketing it to. You know where you're gonna be marketing it. And you've done that all important job of setting the rent correctly. There's now one step remaining before you can start getting people through the door and showing your property off and that is crafting the advert. With property adverts, you don't need to be wildly creative. You don't need to come up with some clever angle or wacky campaign that the world has never seen before. It's not about creativity, it's about giving people the information they need to decide if the property is right for them. We'll list various different things that you should include in your advert, but the first thing to talk about, because it's by far the most important, is the photos. Yet the photo could make or break your let. You may have a brilliant property. It may be at a great price, but if you have an awful photo, you're going to struggle to get the property let. And unfortunately, the standard of photos on Rightmove and Supla often is nowhere near good enough. But that can be an opportunity for you because if you can take good photos of your property, that can make the world a difference when it comes to inquiries. Now, taking good photos is a lot easier than it used to be. Most modern smartphones do a great job of taking a great photo and a bit of time and effort and maybe a few filters will get you the photos that you need. But if you're really struggling, try and find someone you know that is good with a camera who can take better photos than you. And if you've got more of a premium property, you might want to invest in a professional photographer to come round and take photos of your property and spend that money. Remember, your property isn't likely to change much, so you can use those photos for your next let as well. So if you've got a high-end property that attracts a premium rent, then you may want to consider that investment. So getting the right photos is more than half the battle. But there's also some written information that you should include as well. If you're not a natural writer, it's not something you feel confident with and you get scared when you see that empty box on the listing form that needs to be filled in. You don't need anything fancy here. What you're trying to do is give people the information they need to make a decision about whether the property is suitable. And that just means being clear about the most important aspects of the property. And what those are is fairly obvious because you just have to think about what you would want to know if you're making a decision. So some of the things that you'll want to include are which floor it's on if it's an apartment. That's important because some people prefer high floors. Some people want ground floor if they've got young children or mobility issues. If it's a house, what type of house? Is it detached? Is it terraced? Make sure you say. Is furniture included? Another really important one. Is there outdoor space? Is there parking? And again, if it's a modern development, are there any facilities? These are all things that aren't going to be necessarily obvious from the photos, but are very important to anyone who's looking. The thing to remember here is that, as you'll know from looking through other listings yourself to set your pricing, in most areas, people have got a fair amount of choice and they've got a limited amount of time and attention. So if you make someone think, they'll probably just click away. If the furniture that's supplied or the floor that the property is on is important to somebody and they can't get that from your description, there's a chance that they'll phone up to ask, but it's far more likely that they'll just close the window and go off and look at another property where they do have that information. Two other things to add to that description. Say when it's available. If it's available now, say now, because not all properties are. And if it's available in a month's time, well, say that as well, because that might suit some people too. By saying it's available, well, it will help people make a decision and it'll also save you having your time wasted and putting out for what you'll require in terms of referencing. You need to do referencing and we'll come on to that in a later module. But again, list out what's going to be required so people can self-select or rule themselves out from letting your property. So hopefully after the steps we've taken you through so far, you've got a queue of tenants lining up to take your property, but you're not quite there yet because you've got to do viewings. You've got to show them around. 
So in the next module, we'll give you advice on how to conduct the perfect viewing. Now we're getting to the exciting bit. This is where all the hard work that you've done in terms of your research and your photos and your description have paid off and you've got interest in your property. It's nearly time to start proudly showing people around, but not quite yet. As you'll discover if you're trying to let a property yourself, it can be a time-consuming process. And the most time-consuming element of all can be viewings. If you assume that each viewing takes about 15 or 20 minutes and you have to travel there and back, it's quite plausible that you could end up doing loads of viewings and spending hours and hours of your time. But you don't have to because there are a couple of things that you can do to make a far more efficient use of your time. And the first one, which you absolutely must do, is to qualify applicants on the phone before you book in a viewing. Because despite all the effort that you made writing the perfect description, a lot of applicants won't have bothered to read it properly, or they might be inquiring about lots of properties and got a bit mixed up and forgotten to ask an important question. So when they phone up, ask some key questions about what they're looking for and when they're looking to move. You will get people who can't move in for two months even though your property is available now. You might be okay with that, but if you're getting a lot of interest, chances are you'll want somebody who can move immediately. Also, do your best to make some subtle inquiries into whether they'll be suitable for the property. Also, try to subtly find out if they're going to be suitable for the property. Now, you don't want to start interrogating people on the phone and getting into personal questions, but if you just ask open-ended questions like, so tell me about yourself or why are you looking to move? The answers that people give will tell you a lot and you'd be surprised how often very obvious red flags come up. So that's the first thing you can do to maximize your time when it comes to viewings. Make sure you're only showing the property to people where they are suitable for the property and the property is suitable for them. The second thing you can do to maximize your time is don't do them one at a time. No, you want to do block viewings because that will save you time, of course, but it'll also hopefully increase the interest in your property. By taking people around at the same time, it may create a sense of competition and people may be more inclined to put their offers in a little bit sooner than they first intended. Doesn't always work, but you'd be surprised how often it does. While you're on the viewing, make sure you ask key questions to see if they're interested. Something as simple as, what do you think? May give you lots of information. And even if they don't like it, that feedback they give you could be valuable. Yeah, you'll get a sense of who's interested by who's hanging around, who's asking the most questions. And you can turn that into a conversation to get a sense of whether they're the kind of people who you think will be good for the property as well. And don't be afraid during that conversation to ask for the sale. In other words, say, so, would you like to apply? Actually, asking makes all the difference. The easy, non-awkward thing to do is just to bring it to an end and say, well, get in touch. But the thing you have to remember is people aren't normally looking for a property to rent for long. It's generally the case that somebody wants to move or needs to move and they line up lots of viewings within a short space of time and they make a decision quickly. So if they leave your property without you sealing the deal, they're probably going straight on to another viewing. And if they like that property roughly the same amount, but the person who's showing them is a little bit more forward, chances are they're gonna end up applying for that one. So you don't have to be pushy, but don't be afraid either. Hopefully they will answer that question and say, yes, I'm interested, what are the next steps? Well, that is where referencing comes in and that's what we're gonna get into in our next module. So you found someone who wants to let your property. Congratulations, but you're not done. You need to reference the applicant to make sure that they are who they say they are and that they're gonna look after your property and pay your bills. Now referencing doesn't give you complete protection, but it does go a long way to preventing the worst outcomes. So the first thing you need to do is to take a holding deposit to take the property off the market. It's one thing saying you want some property, but make sure they're serious. By taking a deposit, you can validate that. Yep, very simple. You're allowed to take a maximum of one week's rent as a deposit. By doing that, they're showing commitment and you can show commitment as well by stopping any further viewings. Don't take the listing down off the platforms just yet because you never know if the application is going to fall through. But you can just put things on hold while you do these next steps. The next thing you need to do is to take the tenant's ID because, as Rob said, it's really important that you verify they are who they say they are. And you'd be surprised how often that's not the case. So take some photo ID, get a bill or a bank statement with their current address on there and make a copy. Don't need to trek off and find a photocopier. You can just take a photo on your phone. That's absolutely fine. You'll also need to establish their right to rent, which is a government scheme that validates that that person is allowed to be living in the UK. If they've got a British passport, nothing else you need to do. If they don't, if they've got an overseas passport or ID card, then go onto the government website, search right to rent, and you'll find guidance on there about what you need to do. It can get complicated. In most cases, it's pretty simple. So that's the basics out of the way. Then you can move on to the proper referencing. Now, when you reference, you can do this yourself, but it takes a lot of time. 
And if you're new to this, it's probably something you completely want to avoid. So use a referencing provider for checking things like employment, their address history, and any debt like CCJs. You can get this done for less than £20, and it's very easy to do. You may want to save money in other areas, but this is one area you don't want to scrimp. So pay the money, get the checks, and the peace of mind. And even if all those checks come clear, but you're still not quite sure on the tenant for some reason, you can't put your finger on it, that could be your gut speaking to you. Don't ignore it. You'd be surprised how often your gut instinct is correct. If something's not quite adding up, it's probably because it isn't. And your experience is telling you that. You may think that the references and everything else you've done is enough. And it might be. But if you go ahead and your gut instinct's still not quite there, just keep a closer eye on things, at least to begin with. So hopefully the references have come back and they've passed with flying colours. Well, in that case, you are so close to finally having this process finished and your hard work paying off. There's just one more thing left to do, and that is move the tenant in. However, it's not as simple as just handing them the keys and letting them get on with it. There are some very important steps you need to go through, and we'll run through all of those in the next module. Now we're getting to the exciting bit. You've put in all the hard work and you're finally ready to move your tenant in. But it's so important that you don't lose focus at this step. There's a lot of detail here that you need to get right to avoid problems down the line and get the tenancy off to the best possible start. So let's go through what those things are. The first thing that you absolutely must do is prepare a written tenancy agreement. You would be surprised, but we hear from people all the time who've let people move in on a handshake, or maybe they had a friend of a friend who needed somewhere to stay. They've moved in, no written agreement, things get into trouble, and then there's absolutely nothing they can do about it because there's nothing legally setting out the terms of the agreement. Just having anything in writing isn't enough. There are certain clauses that have to be in there by law. There are others that you will definitely want to be in there, but you wouldn't think of it if you were just starting from a blank document and writing it off the top of your head. For that reason, you should start from a template. The major landlord associations all have templates available to their members, and the government also has a free one available on their website. Now, that doesn't save you all the work. You can't just print it out and call it a day. You need to read it, you need to understand it, and you need to modify things as appropriate to reflect the agreement that you've actually come to and any changes you want to make. For example, if the tenant has a pet and you're okay with that, you'll need to put in some terms around that. So be prepared to put some time in here. Any time that you spend getting that agreement right is going to be time well spent because it's going to take you a lot more time if you rush it and get into trouble later. And the good news is once you've got an agreement you're happy with, you can broadly use it for all future tenancies too. So you can do the work once and then use it for as long as you own that property. Now you need to make sure your property is tenant ready. If there are any repairs that need doing, any wear and tear, make sure they are done and also clean it. And not just a quick hoover around and you're done, it needs to be professionally cleaned. Now this work is not all done just because you're a nice landlord, which of course you are, but it's also demonstrating the condition you expect to receive the property back in. You're setting the standard, which leads us to our next point, is taking an inventory, because you are going to record the state of the property, and that will include the fact that it's been professionally cleaned. You will point out any minor wear and tear that may still be there, and you and your tenant will sign this inventory. So you're both in agreement that this is the condition of the property that's being handed over. And this is also setting out the expectation of how you want to see the property return to you. Now, when you choose to do an inventory, you can do it yourself and you can get a template and follow it through and, and that's fine. But you may want to consider paying a professional, someone who does this for a living. It actually doesn't cost that much to do. And that investment, not only will it save you time, but if it's done well and better than you would do, possibly money as well. Of course, if it's not returned to you, close to this original state listed in the infantry, then you'll need to take action. But there are things you can do to protect yourself there. So that's all the prep work done. Now time for your tenants to do their bit and show you the money. Very important, before they move in, you get the first month's rent and the deposit cleared into your bank account. So not just a check, if anyone still uses checks, or not a promise of it coming later, but actually in your account. It's unlikely that anyone's going to try to scam you at this point, but you can never be too careful. The deposit, of course, is that protection that Rob referred to in case you don't get the property back with only fair wear and tear and there's additional work that needs to be done to bring it back up to original standard for the next occupants. The maximum you can set that deposit at by law is five weeks rent but of course you could agree less if you wanted to. 
So with all those preparations done and the rent safely in your bank account, you can go ahead with move-in day. Now move-in day is not a good day for the rainforests because you're going to be wanting to give them a large bundle of documents or of course you can do it digitally instead. There's the tenancy agreement of course, there's the energy performance certificate that you have to give them by law, there's the gas safety certificate which you have to give them by law if there's gas in the property, there's the inventory for them to sign to agree the condition of the property, there's also a document relating to the deposit. The deposit needs to be protected in a registered scheme and that scheme will have a lot of prescribed information and terms and conditions that you need to give to your tenant. And finally, if the property is in England, there's also a government how to rent leaflet, which again, by law, you need to pass on. In the notes under this video, you'll find a link to where you can find out more information about all of that. But again, there's a theme here. It's worth taking the time to get it right. If you fail to pass on all these documents and to get them all signed for, then you could find that if the worst happens and you need to take legal action to get the tenant out, you won't be able to do so because you'll have unknowingly breached one of your duties. So take the time to get it right, hand over the keys, and your job is very nearly done. It is, but just a final bit of admin for you, but make sure you do it. Take meter readings. So you'll need to do all your utilities that you have in a property. So that'll be electric, water, and possibly gas too. But make sure you do it because it can cause headaches further down the line. If you don't, you are registering the point at which your tenant is going to take over for paying those bills. If you don't do it, there could be a dispute further down the line. So make sure you do it and that your tenant agrees with those readings as well. But you'll be pleased to know you've completed all the steps. You can move your tenant in. However, there are a few other things you need to do and much more that you can learn. And in the next video, we're going to take you so, through that. congratulations. Your tenant is in their new home and their rent is in your bank account. You've done everything you need to do to get your property let, except these final points that you need to take care of once the tenant has actually moved in. All very important. The first is to protect that deposit. So as we said, by law, you can take up to five weeks rent as a deposit. But when you do, you must protect it in an official government approved scheme. There's an option where you keep the money in your account and the scheme just insures that money so the tenant can get it back if the property is returned in good condition. Or there's another option where you physically pay the money over to the scheme. It doesn't matter which you choose, it's just a matter of personal preference. But either way, you must register that deposit with the scheme within 30 days of receiving it. And that's 30 days of receiving it, not 30 days of the tenant moving in. So you might as well do it straight away just to make sure you don't forget. Now in the last course module, we told you to take the utility readings. Make sure that you've taken the water, electric, and if needed, gas. Now it's all well and good doing that, but then you need to inform your utility suppliers as well that there is a new person in the property and they will be paying the bills from this point on and you can give them the readings. You'll also need to inform the council, not to be polite and keep them well informed, but because the council tax will no longer be paid by you and it will be paid by your tenant, in the majority of cases anyway, unless you've agreed otherwise. So make sure you take those steps. And finally, a very important one, make a note in your diary of the date that the rent is due. So if you're using a paper diary or calendar, you can mark it in each month. If you're using an electronic version, you can create a recurring reminder and that'll be your prompt to pop into your online banking and just make sure the rent has been paid. Your tenant should have set up a standing order, so it should be coming in completely automated. They shouldn't be forgetting. But if you're busy, it's easy to get lax and it doesn't take long to just quickly check each month that it's arrived. This is particularly important for the first month's rent because the way that you treat that sets the tone for the rest of the tenancy. It doesn't mean you should be aggressive or rude. It doesn't. But you do need to show that you're on top of it. You need to set the expectation that the rent due date is not an aspiration. It's not a target. It's the date that it will be paid. So make sure you send that message loud and clear right at the start. So congratulations. You have completed the complete guide to getting your property less. Now you've been filling in those quizzes and I'm sure you've been passing them along the way. You've got one more to do. So good luck with that.